So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for showing up to the Human Performance Series. I am Anthony Smalls, the uh, coordinator for and program manager for the SWAG Initiative. Um, if you're new, the SWAG Initiative is a goal to connect different uh, professionals in the areas of science and medicine um, and healthcare to come to the platform and speak to the audience about their path, their goal, um, especially if they have previous uh, sports uh, experience, because we want to let uh, our target audience know that you can go from sports and definitely to the world of science and medicine. And today we have a goodie, a sports nutritionist named Adina Neglia. And she works around Sinai, and I'm going to give her an opportunity to tell you her journey, and she's going to have a great presentation for you. So I will pass along. Thank you, Adina, for joining, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so I am a registered dietitian. I um, pretty much got into the field. I was a competitive figure skater, and around 14, 15 years old, when I started getting more serious about skating um, and realizing how much everything else impacted performance, whether it was, you know, just mental health and food and recovery, I really got interested in the food aspect of things. Um, I had two, grand, my grandparents used to pick me up in the morning to skate at 4.35 in the morning, and they both had really different approaches. One, one of my grandfathers would try to force me to eat like a bacon egg sandwich on a bagel at five o'clock in the morning, and the other one would get me a bagel post-workout. And I would start to notice how it would feel with different fuel, or if I realized I didn't eat a lot during the day, how it affected performance. So as I started exploring that for myself and opening my eyes a bit more to what people were doing around me, I just became super interested in, in how food really uh, is a big part of performance and, and recovery. So went to college and, and studied nutrition and started off right away in private practice, working with athletes and from everywhere from ballerinas to basketball players and started consulting for the American Ballet Theater and New York City Ballet. Um, Fast forward a couple years and I'm working at Sinai, running some outpatient programs, outpatient counseling. And long story short, had a doctor I was working with, with a connection with the Brooklyn Nets. They were looking for a dietitian and started with the team two seasons ago. So I've been working uh, with the Brooklyn Nets for the past two seasons, currently still working with them. Uh, New York Liberty, WNBA, uh, ba women's basketball team, and just started uh, this season with the New Jersey Devils. So worked with a variety of, of different athletes, and um, it's it's been amazing to work in different types of sports, females, males, um, and, you know, I, I still skate to this day, so I, you know, I'm not professional or competing at this point, but um, it's amazing. Like I wish I knew <laughs> what I knew now when I was when I was a bit younger. And so I try to think about when I work with my athletes, what would I have wanted to know, um, or what what education did I need? Because you don't know what you don't know. And um, so that that's my goal with working with the teams and working with uh, my my private clients? How can we do this in a realistic, sustainable way and in a way that is going to support your particular sport? Uh, and understanding that I think the biggest thing for athletes is they are not the average person. So athletes need more of everything. And in a culture that is kind of giving us all this different information all of the time, um, one day it's low carb, one day it's low fat, one day it's, you know, athletes should be intermittent fasting. It can be really, really confusing. And I always just try to remind my athletes, like you are not the average person. Um, I mean, even the average person should not be doing most of those things. Um, but, you know, you have to understand you have greater needs and there's, uh, you know, nutrition at the higher level becomes that extra one to 2%, um, you know, so my guys right now are, are going into playoffs and 
they're really, really honing in right now with any little extra. They've got their foundations in there with food. And now we're working on the little extras that are going to give them that extra one to 2%. So that's kind of my story, my journey, my approach. Um, and yeah, did I leave anything out? I'm good. Okay. I would say um, no, um, but quickly, uh, you said playoffs. Yeah. So this is particularly the, the Nets? Yes, we are starting our first playoff game tonight, actually. So I will oh, be showing her to Barclays. Um, um, so you mentioned intermediate fasting. Do you mind if I ask, um, what's the benefit or the pros and cons of intermediate fasting for athletes? Oh, so intermittent fasting. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, I use that as an example of like things that people hear out in the in the mainstream and, and, you know, you see it on social media, people are talking about keto, intermittent fasting, they're talking about, you know, plant-based diet. So there's just like a lot of noise and um, long story short, I don't find intermittent fasting to be um, helpful for athletes. They always need to be fueled, especially for example, something, you know, my, my basketball players who are back to back to back, they need to be consistently fueling. Um, there, in my opinion, it is it is not a beneficial thing for athletes to be doing. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so sorry if that confused anybody. It's more around lines of like everyone hears a lot, and I get all of my clients coming in asking all of those types of questions. Uh, and for my athletes, I have to remind them like you are, you know, not the average person, and your needs are much much higher. Okay. And if anybody uh, has any questions, please feel free to come off mute now uh, or raise your hand or something like that uh, before we get into the presentation. Okay. I don't see anything. Okay. So, so you can begin the presentation. Thank you. Let's jump in. And if there's questions throughout the presentation or anything that anyone wants me to elaborate on, I try to touch on a little bit of little bit of everything um, from the questions that I normally get, but also providing just like the baseline and foundation for sports nutrition. I will say um, over the years, the foundations and the research in sports nutrition has really stayed the same. Um, yes, we have new studies that come out, new supplements, new things but the foundations and practices of sports nutrition have really stayed the same and um, you know, have reflected the science. And so that's why when we have other things coming in, like go low carb, do this, do that, we really always wind up coming back to the basics because that's what works. Oh, okay. Sometimes I feel like the, the, the multiple um, suggestions come as a confusion to kind of either like level the playing field for everybody to either go by this, go by that. It's kind of like, let's promote this for a series. Let's promote this for a series. Is that accurate to say that it's just a promotion tactic? Any of like the, the, other the diets. diets. Oh, for yeah. sure. If you think about it, we have a 70 plus billion dollar diet industry. Most of these diets aren't even vetted by dietitians. They're an easy way to make money. And a lot of it's if you, if you do the research, it's like, hey, this worked for me, so I'm gonna promote this and it's gonna work for everybody else, whether or not it's sound nutrition information. No. So it's, it's a quick way to make a, a good buck, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, that it's backed up by research and science. Oh, okay. Okay, and if anybody has, doesn't wanna, come off uh, mute to ask a question, please feel free to put it in the chat and I will, we will um, definitely ask it for you or uh, call you to, call you out to, to, to ask your question. So thank you. I'll go back on mute. You can start the presentation. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's share a screen here. Um, let me turn this into slideshow. Okay. Okay, so I've done a couple of presentations, whether it's to staff of some of the teams that I've worked with or um, for some of the players, I've pulled a couple things from each to kind of make this more complete depending on the topic. Uh, I've used this, you know, I've reviewed this with some of my athletes. So again, if there's something that's not on here or that you want me to dive deeper into, um, definitely let me know. 
So I think it's important to just start off with the benefits of proper fueling. Um, I think a lot, of, especially when you're young, it's like you're just maybe eating whatever you want and you don't really think about it too much um, and you feel good and you're performing well. Um, but, you know, when we kind of look a little bit closer, there are some really big benefits of, of the timing and what the meal composition is to really help with performance. So obviously benefits increase in athletic performance, mental capacity, energy levels, conditioning levels, cardiovascular, and decrease risk of injury, which I think is a huge one. Nobody wants to be injured and have to take off time from their sport. So nutrition plays a really big role in that. Um, and even if injury does happen, you know, which is unfortunate, but it happens, um, nutrition can play a big role in recovery as well. So things to think about, you know, those are the benefits. Poor nutrition in the athlete, athletes are gonna feel more fatigued. They're not gonna perform as well. Um, younger athletes, they're expending so much energy on top of like growing a human body. So there, it could affect growth, uh, loss of muscle mass or bone mass, uh, decreased immunity and higher injury risk when we're not feeling enough. Um, and to reiterate what I said before, athletes need more of everything. They are not the average person that is just going about their day to day. They need, you know, significantly more carbohydrates. They need more protein, fat, vitamins, and minerals. Uh, they are burning up a tremendous amount of energy and need to replenish and refuel in order to support growth, to support recovery of the workouts and to get stronger and perform well. So I'm going to start with some of the macronutrients and some of the basics. So carbohydrates, we all know it's the body's main source of energy and it's preferred fuel choice. So when an athlete is out there running on the field or on the court, our body is burning through our carbohydrate stores first, and it really relies on those carbs. Um, what's really important about carbohydrates is their protein sparing. So what a lot of people don't realize is when we don't get enough carbohydrates, because our body prefers that fuel source, it actually starts to turn to, you know, protein and converts protein into carbohydrates, which is a very inefficient process. And that takes protein away from what its job actually is, which is to rebuild um, and, and recover the muscles. So when we're low on carbs, protein can't do its job because protein has to take over for the carbohydrates. Um, carbs are stored in our muscles as, as glycogen, something called glycogen, and that's where the body pulls from when we're active. So when we aren't getting enough carbohydrates and we deplete those glycogen stores, we're going to have less energy for our next workout and potentially put ourselves at risk for injury. And then finally, it helps maintain normal, 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 normal blood sugar levels that are essential for brain food. Our brain also prefers carbohydrates and glucose for energy. So um, that's gonna be really important for when we need to like think quickly and sharp and again, have that energy source. So this is something an athlete really needs at every single meal and every snack opportunity, especially for something, you know, if we're not getting a lot of recovery days in between, um, this is gonna be the bulk of the diet. So, this could be even higher in, depending on the sport, like 50 to 75% um, percent of the diet, but 50 to 65% of calories should come from carbohydrates. And an easy way to kind of translate that or to aim for athletes is aiming for a half plate of carbs. So there's different types of carbohydrates and times to, that are more beneficial to have them. So we've got our complex carbs and we've got our simple carbs. So complex carbs are going to be those things like whole grains, brown rice, whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, our oatmeal, sweet potato. And then we have our simple carbs like white rice, white bread, maybe even baked goods or just your normal cereal. And they really do both have a time and a place. So we don't want to be having a whole bunch of fiber before we go and work out. So if we have like a half hour or so before our workout, we don't want to run and go grab the, the brown rice or a really high fiber bread. 
because then our body is going to be busy digesting that fiber because that takes a while and it's not going to be able to let the blood flow go to the muscles and you know we're going to just be busy digesting so that's where these simple carbs actually can be helpful and come in handy um, and this could even include also like a quick piece of fruit. This can include um, a granola bar, like a simple granola bar, something easy to digest around the workout. So you're not busy digesting when you're supposed to be using your muscles and running around. It's not comfortable. So they both have a place away from the workouts. It's important to get some complex carbohydrates in. They take a little bit longer to digest. So they're going to provide um, energy over a longer period of time. The body is going to release carbs over a longer period so that you have consistent en energy for about three to four hours. So protein, I think, is always a big focus for athletes, and a lot of athletes know that it's important. I think sometimes it's overemphasized, um, but, you know, obviously the benefits are, are huge, so promotes growth uh, and repair of muscle tissues, enhances immunity, and it's a key, it's key for manufacturing muscle. If we're trying to build muscle, get stronger, we need protein. When we're exercising, we're breaking down muscle fibers and we need the protein to go in there, help repair them and make them stronger. So different sources of protein, we obviously, I think a lot of people know, we've got our chicken, beef, fish, eggs, uh, dairy, protein powders, and of course, there are some plant sources. Nuts and seeds will contain some protein. Um, things like tofu, tempeh. The gold standard is, is milk protein, so whey and casein. And they are best absorbed by the body and they have complete amino acid profiles, meaning they're complete proteins. They're gonna give us all the amino acids we need for the building blocks to help repair and recover the body. Thing, the plant proteins, again, still offer protein, but they're not as bioavailable to us, meaning our body can't use them as efficiently. So if we have a vegan or a vegetarian player, they often have to eat a little extra protein so that they're getting what they need. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with, with plant proteins, um, they can often, like if you have something like a like beans, they'll be considered an incomplete protein by themselves. So that means, again, they don't have all of the essential amino acids to make the building, building blocks to do the job that protein does. So they often have to be paired with something else. So for example, if beans are missing the amino acid, amino acid methionine, they need to be paired with a brown rice that's going to have that missing amino acid and then they'll be more complete. So it takes some careful planning. It is not the best absorbed or the highest scoring type of protein, but it can still be managed with a careful plan um, to get all the protein needs in if somebody is relying on plant-based protein sources. And I'll, I'll just mention here, this kind of goes a little bit more advanced into the science, but typically plant proteins are missing the main amino acid that kind of unlocks muscle protein synthesis. Uh, and that's leucine. So leucine is a really, really important amino acid that, is, that tends to be pretty low in plant proteins. So if we're talking gold standard, you know, whey protein, uh, you know, any type of uh, milk proteins, chicken, fish, steak, eggs are a great source of protein, all complete with all of the amino acids. So the question of how much really depends on the type of exercise, how intense the exercise is, how frequent it is, and the individual's dietary intake or their current intake. Elite athletes can aim for anywhere from 1.6 to even 2.2, sometimes higher depending on the goals, um, grams of protein per kilo. Um, and you know that could be anywhere from like if we have a 200 pound you know, athlete that's looking to just maintain muscle mass or even gain weight, they might be at 200 grams of protein, gram per pound. Um, so I gave, actually, I'll go back real quick. I gave some examples of like, you know, three ounces of most meat or fish are going to be anywhere from 21 to 26 grams of protein. That's about a, a size of a deck of cards. Um, so I don't think anyone needs to go in and calculate. I think just incorporating some protein at each meal is super helpful. Um, 
but for someone that really needs to hone in with a specific goal, it might be nice to know how to break it up and what, what foods contain protein. Uh, but we definitely want to spread this evenly throughout the day. We don't want to be trying to catch up on protein at, you know, at dinner time and have a big eight ounce piece of chicken and, and something else. We want to make sure that we spread it out at meals and snacks throughout the day. Um, and especially before and after workouts, again, to repair muscles and to enhance strength and hypertrophy related adaptations that we're, we might be doing in the weight room. So fats are actually also another major fuel source for athletes. So once we're done using up our carbs, our body will switch over and start to use fat. Um, again, we don't want to use protein because it has a really important role in, in muscle recovery and building. We don't want to make it a fuel source. So healthy fats are really important for brain health. They actually help your body absorb fat soluble vitamins. So if we're just always having steamed veggies and very low fat diet, we're actually not able to absorb the nutrients in the vegetables as well. So we always want to have a little bit of fat. Um, it's also super important for hormone, optimal hormone production. So, you know, especially for males that, you know, we know that testosterone is important for, for gaining strength and building muscle. If we're not having enough fats or overall calories, um, you know, that's, that's not going to be optimized. Um, preferred fats would be things like nuts and seeds, olive oil, avocados, avocado oil, you know, relying less on fats from fried foods or, um, you know, other oils that might be more inflammatory. So these are kind of the, the key ones that we want to include uh, that will support, you know, inflammation, brain health, hormones, all of the stuff previously mentioned. And I'll go more into where to put the fat around the workouts because that's important. So with all those macronutrients in mind, one of the big things that I discuss with athletes is always aiming for a fuel mix at their meals. So adding the carbs, the protein, and some healthy fat. How that's done is, is very personalized. And again, when we get into the pre and post-workout meals, I'll explain what we wanna be focusing on. So this is a typical, like you could find this, this is by the Olympic Committee, um, when we talk, you know, I kind of create my own, but this is the more detailed one. So hard training day, you can see here, there's a big emphasis on carbohydrates. You've got a quarter plate lean protein, quarter plate vegetables, um, you know, flavors, you know, that's just extra to make it taste good, some fruit, and we do have some healthy fats in a smaller amount. If we have, you know, for my, my basketball players, this is the plate every day. Like this is, we don't go to the more moderate training plate because they're go, go, go. And it's a really tough season this year. Um, but if there is a, someone trying to maybe lean out in the off season, or maybe they have an off, you know, a day off, can aim more for the moderate training plate. I really don't think for a professional athlete or for an, an athlete that's, you know, even just doing 20 plus hours a week, that they really need to go less than this. You know, this would be more of the third, third, third protein greens and uh, vegetables. So visuals, I think sometimes are helpful when athletes are putting together their plate and this is a nice balance to think about. So pre-workout, um, so I really ask athletes like, don't, Practice this on practice days, not on a game day for any, anything different. You never want to change anything different on a game day or a match day. And because everyone digests differently, we don't, it, it is your own kind of like experiment with, with food and snacks that work for you. So typically though, I would say after a larger meal, you want to wait two hours before you're going to go and do your activity and maybe have a snack 30 to 60 minutes out instead of right before. I know some people that, that can go out, they can eat even more than just an easy digestible carbohydrate and they're fine. Uh, but this is something that's really individual to the person, but I'd say the two hours and then maybe like the 60 minute mark is most commonly digested well and, and feels good and is energizing for the workout. So 
three to four hours before, again, maybe even that two to four hours before, depending on how well you digest or if you're nervous on game day, um, we're gonna focus on high carbohydrates, just like that half plate that I showed before, some protein, but with little fat and fiber. We don't wanna completely cut it out three to four hours beforehand, but we don't wanna have like a big ribeye steak that's gonna take a long time to digest or a huge salad with a lot of roughage and fiber. Again, that's all just kind of gonna slow things down um, and not let the carbs and protein go and do its job. 30 to minutes to even two hours before, again, because there's some athletes that really don't wanna eat super close to their workouts or even like my dancers who have to get out and like super tight leotards, like it's hard to have a larger volume of food. Um, so you wanna focus on quick digesting, simple carbohydrates, a little less protein beforehand. Again, that's something that might take longer to digest and little to no fat or fiber. Uh, you, you know, things like I've had athletes come in, oh, I grab a Quest bar before I go and do my workout. That's got 20 grams of fiber and you're gonna be busy digesting rather than focusing on your, your, your muscles and the activity that you have to do. because It's just gonna slow you down. So during exercise, if it's less than 45 minutes and it's not super intense, you're not outside, it's not really, really hot out, um, you're gonna just focus on water to stay hydrated. At the 45 to 75 minute mark, you're gonna think about adding small amounts of carbs throughout the activity. So this is where a sports drink might come in handy and having a couple sips every 15 to 20 minutes to replenish fluids, to replenish electrolytes and to replenish some of the carbohydrates that you're using up. Um, if it's one hour to two and a half hours of a uh, session, you're gonna aim for 30 to 60 grams of carbs per hour plus fluids. So this, you know, 30 grams could be some type of, like I think of like the honey stinger chews and maybe a couple sips of, of a sports drink. Again, these are all easy to digest carbs because you don't wanna be busy digesting when you're exercising. I've even seen with cycling, um, huge benefits to getting close to 80 to 90 grams of carbs per hour. So that takes some careful planning um, and, might feel uncomfortable, which is why you train the gut over the practices and see how it feels during practice uh, times, not on an actual race day or game day. Um, and then halftime is a great time to refuel. It's gonna be similar to practice, but that's usually kind of the halfway point where we wanna grab a sports drink, um, you know, put out some of the chews, something easy to digest, some fruit, and then you get back on the court and finish the game. So again, just some ideas, depending on how you digest, you have to play around with, with some of these for yourself. And these snack ideas could be anywhere from, you know, I probably wouldn't have the trail mix 30 minutes before, but maybe an hour or two hours before that could work. So granola bars, fruit, some yogurt and granola, trail mix, a little banana, peanut butter, all, all good snack ideas, half a sandwich, half a lean turkey sandwich. Um, if you're having a meal two to four hours before, again, focusing on carbs, keeping it with lean proteins like chicken or fish or turkey, a little bit of vegetable, not too much fat. So, you know, pasta, turkey, meatballs, and some veggies, chicken, sweet potato, uh, maybe some chicken fajitas. Again, lean, keep it simple, keep it high carb. So that brings us to post-workout. So I like to think, and I think it's easy to remember, if you think of the three R's of recovery. So rehydrate, replenish, and rebuild. Water and electrolytes are lost in sweat when you're active um, and will go into hydration in a couple slides. So I'm not gonna dive too deep into this, but super important. Replenish refers to the carbohydrates. In a 60 to 90 minute session, especially if it's intense, you can completely, deplete your glycogen stores, your carb stores and your muscle. So um, that's not the goal. We don't want that to happen, but we really want to make sure that carbs are, are the main, main part of this post-workout. And then again, protein helps build and repair the muscles after a hard workout. So we want to include moderate protein as well. 
Uh, so for athletes, serious athletes, you're going to think about a four to one or a three to one ratio of carbs to protein, and you want to keep it low fat. Again, fat takes longer to digest, and we don't want digestion to slow because protein and carbs can't get to the muscles as quickly when fat's slowing it down. Same with fiber. So this could mean something like uh, a chocolate milk and a banana or some type of bar in order to get that four to one or three to one ratio of carbs to protein. Um, within that 45 minutes, even I'll stretch it an hour, you really want to get protein and carbs in. So protein shake, just like I said before, chocolate milk and banana, maybe a Gatorade and a protein bar and thinking about fluids, electrolytes, protein and carbs very little fat, very little fiber. Um, we talk about the window of opportunity. I don't know if people have heard of that before, like that hour after the workout, like you've got to get that protein shake in. And I see a lot of people just take a scoop of protein and mix it up in some water. Well, you're missing the carbs, which are going to help, help the protein do its job. Um, but also if you are more of like a recreational, like you've got a day in between, or you've got two days in between, you know, resting from a workout, that window of opportunity really becomes more of like recovery over 48 to 72 hours. So as long as you're getting what you need, it's not like this immediate have to. But as an athlete who's gonna be recovering and, and performing nearly every day, this becomes more important. So I would get that in pretty soon after the workout, just like I do with my athletes, they get off the court, they get off the ice, shake, shower, do their thing post, post game and then they can sit down for a meal. But we don't wanna be losing all of that time in between when we could start the recovery process. So within the one to two hours post game or workout, we're gonna aim for that half plate of carbs, quarter plate protein, quarter plate vegetables. Um, depending on the person and their goals, maybe we would do the third, 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 uh, but typically it's gonna be that higher carb amount, lower fat, lower fiber. So post, you know, some of these could be repeated for the pre-workout, but we've got some simple lean proteins, carbs, some vegetables. You're not, again, gonna see a big ribeye steak here. We don't want any fat slowing down digestion. Um, if we're doing a post-workout snack, this is where, you know, maybe we have the snack and we eat an hour or two later. Uh, chocolate milk, um, protein shakes, yogurt and berries. If you wanna eat food, some tuna and crackers could be fine or a small turkey sandwich. Uh, but I find that, especially for people that don't have as much of an appetite after a really rough workout, the, the beverages are a bit easier. So I'm not gonna read through this whole thing. Um, it's a lot of words, but basically, you don't want to wait until you're thirsty to be drinking. And our hydration status is really reflective of what we were doing the hours before the game or before the practice. So it's not like we want to wait until we get to, you know, game time and, oh, I've got to hydrate and I'm just going to try to catch up. You need to be doing this consistently. Um, you know, by the time you're thirsty, you've already lost about 2% of your body weight in water and you're, you're moving towards dehydration. And that's important because just two to 4% um, fluid loss can cut your strength and training workout, your power. We've got some statistics here from some studies um, and even just concentration, cognition, it, it affects a lot. So it's a very fine balance and we want to make sure that it's not that we're catching up before or after, but that we're hydrating throughout the entire day. And I'll get into sports drinks a bit more because that's always a question. Um, and they typically become more important after about 45 minutes to an hour of activity, especially if it's outside, it might even be sooner. Uh, and again, that's because we need to replenish our electrolytes that have been lost in sweat that are really important, fluid loss and the carbohydrates. And everyone asks, you know, how much should I drink? And there are some calculations you could find online. There's nothing like set in stone. I always like to go by, you know, this is not the most beautiful picture, but, you know, what does your urine look like? Because that's a really good indicator of how hydrated you are. So, you know, the lighter color indicates that you're properly hydrated. If you're at the three to four, you're already dehydrated and we're going to have to catch up and, and try to get you there. But 
even in the smallest amounts, it will affect performance. So sports drinks, as I said, they're really actually necessary during high intensity heavyweight exercise, anything lasting longer than that 45 to 60 minutes. Um, they contain electrolytes like sodium, potassium, magnesium, which are important for relaying nerve impulses, making your muscles contract or relax, and regulating your fluid balance and keeping you hydrated. We mostly lose sodium in sweat. The other ones are a little bit more minimal, but that's really important. And you could, you know, you know if you're a salty sweater, if you sweat, you let it dry, and then you've literally got like salt flakes on you. Um, and that means you're losing a lot of salt and that's important to replenish so that you can kind of help with those muscles and, you know, relay the nerve impulses so that you can perform well. Um, and then for carbohydrates, same thing. Like if we're burning through our glycogen stores and we talk about needing and after an hour or 90 minutes of working out 30 to 60 grams of carbs per hour, that's gonna help. And we don't want to have whole foods at that time. Everyone says, oh, what about the sugar in sports drinks? That's the point, you know, it's glucose. It's already broken down. It's gonna go right to the muscle and we don't have to be busy um, digesting or anything. It's just gonna get right there, give us our energy and then we can move on. Again, if you are a recreational, you know, type of person that just goes to the gym and does a yoga class or, or a Pilates, you probably don't need a sports drink. But if you are, you know, a, an intense athlete that is exercising multiple hours a day or um, that 60 to 90 minute mark, if you're a heavy sweater, these become very, very important. So supplements is another topic that comes up a lot. And and, and even from my teenage athletes. So what I, I want to just put out there first is all of the studies on a lot of these supplements really aren't for children or teenagers. You know, they're not meant for people less than, you know, 18 years old. We're not studying all of these supplements on children. So that's just one thing. And especially with the amounts that are in the supplements, not necessarily based off of a young teen. Um, but I think we need to go over what a supplement is, is um, because it include a whole include vitamins, minerals, protein powders, probiotics, BCAAs, pre-workouts, all of these things are considered supplements. And what I think a lot of people make a mistake is they want to get all of the supplements um, and their diet's not that great or their sleep and recovery isn't that great. And if those things aren't in place, the supplements aren't really going to work. Um, and then I think we have to be careful because if we decide to take a multivitamin and then we're grabbing a, a beat, uh, pre-workout and we're having, you know, 50,000% of our B vitamins for the day, that's not helpful either. So I think it's really important to not be casual about supplements uh, and making sure that we're taking a food first approach where we're optimizing our diet and then we can look and see if we need to fill in some of the gaps. Um, and then even for, I mean, to be honest, even for my more recreational athletes that aren't even getting tested, you know, as an elite athlete, you're going to be tested, um, drug tested. And that's where we have to be careful about supplements and they must be NSF certified or informed choice. That means that there is a third party that is testing the product and ensuring that there's no banned substances, um, in the product that people could test for and then eventually not be allowed to play their sport. So I think um, in general, even if it's not sport related, supplements are not regulated by the government, by the FDA. So there's no requirement to provide evidence that a supplement works uh, and you don't have to demonstrate that it's safe. A lot of times the FDA won't pull something from the market until something bad happens and then they go in and they test it. So some su supplements can contain those bad substances, worst case scenario, best case scenario, it doesn't have what it says, it says it has, and it's just a bunch of filler in there. So how to avoid risk, only choosing supplements that are NSF certified, that lets you know it's been third party tested and approved and you could feel mostly safe taking that. And as I said before, you know, the foundations come first the last thing we think about is going to be supplements. Of course, if maybe you're vegan or you're vitamin D deficient, um, those things are necessary to fill the gaps. But 
if you, you know, don't have any deficiencies, you're not following a, a restrictive diet, we need to get all of the other components in place first before we even consider supplements. So if you're telling me you need a pre-workout because you're tired, well, why are you tired? Are you sleeping enough? Do you, are you eating enough carbs? Those things have to come first before we start thinking about adding other things in, especially those type of supplements. And again, what else are you taking? Is that going to you know, mix well together? Are you on any medications? Is that going to mix well together? So all of these things listed here are going to come first before I even start talking about supplements with athletes. Uh, this is another topic that I'll kind of swerve over to that comes up a lot. And I've noticed the last, um, you know, just working in the team setting. So body composition and, and body fat percentage and ideal ranges for athletes. So body composition refers to the amount of muscle, fat, bone, and, and other vital parts of the body kind of showing, okay, what's your lean muscle mass versus your fat mass. Um, and you're not always going to see that reflected on the scale. There's, you know, so there's ways to measure body composition. So skin folds, calipers, cheapest, easiest way. But it, if you're not well-trained, there's a lot of human error involved. Uh, the bioelectrical impedance scales where you step in and, and, you know, it kind of measures based on how quickly the electrical current goes through the body hydrostatic weighing, which is the gold standard, and DEXA, which is also a pretty good way to measure body composition as long as you fit in the DEXA scanner, because uh, my professional basketball athletes usually do not. Um, so it's not, it's not always entirely accurate. And again, I just wanna emphasize here, like there's a lot of human error in some of the cheaper, easier ways to do things. And I think it's really important that we understand low body fat percentage does not always equal better performance. So I've had some athletes that wanted to lean out or their coach told them they had to get to a certain amount of body fat and they did not do it appropriately and performance actually plummeted and they got injured. So I think it's important how we talk to athletes or how we think about body composition, because it doesn't always mean that you're going to be a better performer if you're leaner. So that leads me into just briefly discussing eating disorders in sport, because I see it all the time. Um, and, you know, I think if someone, if you're talking to somebody that is, you know, kind of more in, in, interested in body composition and lowering body fat. Like we have to be careful about how we use these numbers and how we bring about these things with getting on the scale and body composition with athletes. So several risk factors, depending on sport, sports that emphasize appearance or requiring people to make weight. So bodybuilding, gymnastics, wrestling, um, things that sports that focus on individuals rather than an entire team. So dance, diving, figure skating, anti-gravity sports, ski jumping, or other type of jumping events, endurance sports, track and field, and swimming. I kind of highlighted here because it comes off of the last slide, an inaccurate belief that a lower weight will improve performance. And as we get more into the nitty gritty, um, you know, kind of psychological and environmental stuff, low self-esteem, family dysfunction, if there's people in the family with eating disorders, uh, physical or sexual abuse, cultural pressure, traumatic life experiences. These are all risk factors for eating disorders in sport. Um, and I always think, you know, this is important. And I think a lot of people look to certain sports like maybe, you know, dance or even figure skating and gymnastics. And, you know, that makes sense to them that, you know, with that kind of aesthetic that there's more eating disorders in those sports, but, eating disorders do not discriminate. They can happen in males, females, any ethnicity, any, um, you know, religious background. Like there's no, you know, it's normally known as kind of like the, the white girl middle-class um, eating disorder, um, but it affects a wide range of people. And I think a lot of them go unrecognized because people are looking for a certain look with eating disorders and that does not exist. Um, 
actually less than 6% with the, of people with eating disorders are medically diagnosed as underweight. So they don't have to be stick thin and emaciated to be suffering behind the scenes. And a large study found that clinical or subclinical eating disorders were more prevalent in athletes than the general population. And I think that's where we have to be careful when athletes are becoming, you know, are really involved in nutrition or in using it for performance. We have to, it's a fine line and, and we have to make sure we're watching that. Um, and of course, they're more prominent in sports that focus on leanness and weight. So 40 to 42% of females in aesthetic sports like skating or dancing or gymnastics and 30 to 35% of females in weight class sports suffer from eating disorders. And for male athletes, about 17 to 18% in weight class sports and 20 to 40, 22 to 42% in gravitational sports suffer from eating disorders. And I think that's underestimated because again, some people don't think that they're thin enough or that they meet the criteria to have eating disorders. And a lot of people are actually, um, you know, told that they have great willpower or this is just part of the sport and they have the discipline and it, it can go unnoticed. So obviously they're at risk for same medical complications of anyone with an eating disorder, but they're at higher risk for things like stress fractures, electrolyte disturbances, injury. Um, so there's a whole list here, a lot of GI upset because when you're not giving your body enough, it starts to slow down the body systems and that can include digestion and reproduction. So any type of like constipation or slow digestion often comes up, which is problematic when you're trying to perform hormonal imbalances for women. It could be a loss of menstrual cycle. Um, the list goes on and on. And just to go over some warning signs, um, you know, as, as I brought a couple up earlier, but, and this is in general too, but you can hear, you know, maybe athletes um, or even for yourself thinking of food as, as good or bad. There's no gray area. It's good or bad. These cookies are so bad. I shouldn't be eating them. Or I was good today and I ate a salad. Um, things to be listening for. You don't trust yourself around certain foods. So I don't keep cereal in the house. I'll definitely overdo it. Or I can't have X, Y, and Z, whatever the food is. I don't trust myself. Uh, you think about food all the time. We often do that when we're starving ourselves because our body's trying to communicate to us to eat. So it keeps bringing up you know, thoughts of food, you know, so you might already be thinking about what you're eating for lunch when you're eating breakfast and thinking about food takes up a lot of time and can often bring some anxiety uh, for a person. Choosing a lot of sugar-free or diet versions of food to save calories, noticing if an athlete is kind of going, you know, picking some sugar-free stuff or low carb stuff that those are kind of early warning signs or being kind of obsessed about those labels. And you know, um, unrealistic body expectations. And I think for women, they're all told that smaller is better and thinner is better. And for males, it could sometimes be dysmorphia in the other way of they don't feel like they have enough muscle or they're not big enough or they're not ripped enough. And I've had kids as young as 11 and 12 coming in and telling me as, you know, I had a 12 year old boy, a swimmer um, that started restricting um, and has an eating disorder because he felt like his shoulders weren't muscular enough. So I see it in both males and females and um, there's a lot of pressure on athletes to look a certain way. And when they're kind of starting to worry about this or their body fat percentage number, um, this ultimately obviously um, leads to poor performance and, and physical and mental health. So just some key takeaways, this was like really, really broad. And I tried to think about all the questions that come up and a lot of the things that I see in my practice. And I thought it was really important to add the eating disorder piece because in a society that is so obsessed with diets and, and, and the thin ideal and how bodies can look like athletes are, are a big part of that. And I, I see it every day in my practice and I see it in the behaviors of some of my, even some of my professional athletes that for example, are told that they need to lower body fat and go off the deep end. So we really need to be aware of that. Um, but you know, key takeaways, aiming for that fuel mix at meal, really emphasizing carbohydrates for the athlete, eating every three to four hours, consistently fueling the tank, um, 
staying hydrated, not just at game time or post-practice needs to happen throughout the day. We need to plan ahead sometimes if you know you're going to be, you know, traveling for things like let's start to think about when you're going to get your meals in, what snacks you need to pack, um, get those micronutrients in, those fruits and vegetables, and, you know, kind of in a broad statement, stay away from fad diets. They are not meant for athletes. They're not meant for most people and athletes just require more. So that is it. That wraps that up. Open for questions if anyone has any. First, thank you very much. This was, was great and um, learned a lot, but I will definitely let everybody that is on to come off mute to ask a question. I just want to say thank you very much. I learned a lot. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody want to post a question in chat? Okay, we have one. Yeah, um, hi, I'm uh, Robert Parisian. I'm uh, <clears throat> currently in my fellowship. I'm going to be actually joining the sports department at Mount Sinai um, in September. So I look forward to working with you, uh, Dina. And sorry, I sort of missed the intro introductory session there at the beginning. Oh, yeah, no, Nick, great to meet you. So um, <clears throat> I did have a few questions. Um, Kind of functionally, so I was an athlete, you know, I played sports in high school and then I was, I was a college football player. And then obviously now in sports medicine, I've been a team doc for Boston University and, and Penn Athletics uh, in, in the past. And um, <clears throat> when I come there, I'll be with the US Open and then also working with the US Ski and Snowboard. But, you know, from my perspective and, and, and back when we were an athlete, we didn't have these sort of resources. You know, we didn't have a sports nutritionist. We didn't have a sports psychologist. And, you know, we were told certain things and we took them, we took them as dogma. And so I guess uh, for what, what are your thoughts on the, I, I saw the pre-workout and post-workout um, um, meals and regimens, but uh, as far as the sort of quote unquote carbo loading, um, you know, 24 to 48 hours ahead of time, where are you on that? And, and, and where's the literature on, on that currently? Yeah, that's a good question. That kind of hasn't come up in a really long time. I think in some ways, I think it's a bit old school. Um, and, you know, I think that, and that, and that's mostly for I, more of racing or marathons or cycling for the most part. Um, but it, it's a bit old school. I think it still needs to be this consistent. We don't want to have this big carb dump every once in a while, and then like not feel so great the next day. I find that athletes do better do well when they're consistently consuming carbohydrates throughout the day and a little bit more around the workouts, but it doesn't have to be this big carb bomb where we're not having a balance because all of the macros are necessary. Um, and we can keep that percentage still high, but it's, it's definitely more, it's, that, that's fading out of practice. And sorry, I don't mean to ask other questions there at another, uh, quick one um with regards to your athletes and, and the education so um as far as hydrating during during the sport you said 45 minutes or so in uh, having that the, that electrolytes um via the sports drinks are you educating these athletes like pre-season you know do you get them all together in, in in a room go through a nutrition you know you, you go through a talk and have them ask questions and really educate them up up front because a lot, a lot of this, obviously, the onus is on the athlete. Now, you can have some of these things available to them, but ultimately, it's their education, you know, right, that is going to, um, you know, allow them to be doing all these things appropriately. Or are you actually physically there for most of these games and sort of, you know, reminding them or, or you know, having them uh, follow some of these different, uh, re, you know, dietary um, things? Yeah, so it depends on the athlete and team. Getting a bunch of my NBA players together at the same time, probably not going to happen. <laughs> um, even the WNBA, even just the, the teams, is, it's really hard to do that. So a lot of times it's more focused on providing the education. Um, whether I'm creating educational content and I send it in a group text or it's up on a flyer somewhere, or, um, you know, I, I, for one of my teams, I start like an, an 
private Instagram where I'm sharing that information. And it just gets reiterated as I provide staff education as well. So um, the individual one-on-one -on -one is probably the most effective because then it's, this is exactly what you need as for you as an individual versus like, here's some broad recommendations. Um, I wish that I could have like a full day of just presentation where everybody's going to sit and listen to me. I mean, I would right. love to do that. Um, but it's more of building the rapport, then getting their ear and um, just making it available, visuals and, and repetition. Okay. Yeah, that's why I ask, because I know a lot of these, you know, as, you, as you've seen a lot of these athletes, especially depending on, on you know, what their education was like, where they came from in, in high school uh, or in college, which again, typically was not great. And I even know now is not, is not, the best, you know what I mean? Even at, like I said, Boston University and Penn, for example, the great division one universities. And, and even then they're not getting some of this education. And mm -hmm. so a lot of these athletes, you know, as I'm sure when they get to you finally at the, at the professional level, their habits that they have formed or have not formed are not necessarily the best uh, habits. They've been getting by on their athletic abilities. Um, um, and their, their sort of nutrition has not, it, it, despite their nutrition, I guess. Yeah, and that's the, that's the hard part. Like you can get away with it for a little bit when you're younger. And then as you get more advanced and as you get older, those things really start to make a difference and are really, really important. So it's, I get athletes from all different backgrounds, whether it's like zero nutrition education and they come to me eating fast food or they're doing research themselves and they dive into a deep hole of you know, just restrictive eating because they feel like they research everything and are scared to eat anything at that point or need to pull carbs. Like it's too extreme sometimes. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's really meeting the, the athlete where they're at, you know, I'm not going to have somebody that's used to McDonald's like, okay, here's some quinoa and turkey meatballs, right? Like it's, we have to find an in-between and, and make it feel realistic for them. So, so Adina, this is a uh, Reg Miller. This was this was really great. Uh, can you give the student athletes on the on the call just uh, some quick tips on on how they can plan out their day? You know, because some of this does require some prior thought. Yeah. Um, but you don't want it to be too onerous where they can't comply. So, just some simple things that they can do to make it easier to get into a routine. Yeah, and I think most broadly, if you can focus on the visuals and the plate method um, of the half plate carbs, quarter plate protein, quarter plate vegetables, and think about fueling every three to four hours, that could be even just a good place to start. I know a lot of athletes that I've worked with usually skip breakfast or they'll just grab a couple snacks for a lunch and they're busy. Um, so I think even just optim like making sure that the meals are prioritized and you have some good grab and go options if needed. Um, and even if we were to run through like an, an easy sample day, if you have like an afternoon practice, you know, maybe breakfast is going to look something like, um, you know, either a bagel with some peanut butter and a milk or eggs and toast and some fruit. A couple hours later, you're gonna have your lunch. Maybe that's some pasta and chicken and vegetables. And then if you're getting ready, like, you know, after school, you've got a half hour or you've got like three hours from that lunch period until you're about to go do your activity, that's when you might want to plan to pack something, whether you have some sort of granola bar or some fruit, um, just to kind of make sure, you know, you have to think if you're eating lunch at 12 o'clock and it feels like a full lunch and it carries you probably till, till four-ish, you know, if you're going to start practice at three and then you're not done and you're, and you're getting home at like five or six, we have to think about that. How are you going to make sure you have some fuel in between that time? Um, and those quick and easy digestible carbs could be really helpful or the drinks if you're not feeling super hungry during the workout. Um, so it's planning ahead, having some snacks, thinking, okay, what time am I finishing? And should I be fueling just a little bit in the tank before I go a long time without eating. Um, 
So I don't know if that could be helpful. I think it's just like organizing yourself and structuring your day and really uh, prioritizing the pre and the post workout. Okay. I saw that we had a question in the chat. It says peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Is that good before a basketball game? So PB and J is super, super popular in the NBA. Um, I would say if you give yourself time to digest a good pre-workout, um, I don't, I, I would play around with that on practice days. Um, you know, maybe try it like an hour beforehand, see how you digest. And then, you know, if it works for you, that's great. So that's where I said, even in the pre-workout area, like everyone's going to digest differently and um, everyone has very different needs. So that could be great for you while somebody else, you know, is going to require either a little bit less or a little bit more, but definitely a good one to have. Give yourself some time to digest. I wouldn't do that like 30 minutes or 15 minutes beforehand. And if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to come off mute or come off camera and ask your question directly or put it in the chat and I will call your name or uh, direct your question. So in the meantime, I will ask, um, I was curious to know about uh, the, I guess you could call them fads, uh, stuff that like the electrolytes and, and stuff like that, that type of waters and stuff like that. Is that, is there a difference between regular water, electrolyte water, um, um, tap water, and, and like the various other uh, alkaline waters and stuff like that. I even heard of um, K, um, Kagan water might be the best water out there uh, for health. So I was just curious to know what all the, all the water that they're targeting that should be free, <laughs> they cost an arm and a leg, what's the best water to, to have as an athlete? One that you mentioned? The Kagan? Kagan, I don't even know what that is. I'm gonna have to look it up. Yeah, it's, I, I believe it's from the um, uh, like a Asian Asian region. Um, okay. Yeah, it's funny. There's a. I saw they sent us free samples of a can of water, so it looks like either a beer or maybe an energy drink, and the ad, the advertisement it was all black and it says "liquid death, murder your thirst." And I think like, there's just like so much marketing and like, and that's what it is. Like, it's just water in there, but I think it's like marketing to try to make water cool or like look like it's in an energy drink or something. Mm -hmm. um, listen, there's some, you know, if, if water is naturally going to have some minerals, you know, and it's naturally going to have some things. If you want to get an electrolyte enhanced water, if you're not an elite athlete and don't need the extra carbs and all of that kind of stuff, fine to have. As far as like the alkaline waters and the, the thoughts around, you know, acid, um, acid and alkaline, your body, if you were, you know, off of your pH, which your body usually wants to be around 7.4, like you'd be dead. Like your body knows how to regulate this. You don't need you, anything that you eat or drink is not going to affect your body's pH because it's so tightly regulated. So those type of waters are, uh, I think they're a waste, a waste of money. Um, any of the pH balance, any of that kind of stuff, but yeah, I, I think you don't have to spend $10 on a water bottle. Um, get a good brand that tastes good to you. And if you need the electrolytes and the other stuff for, um, electrolyte recovery and carbs, then you choose a sports drink. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll Does anybody else has any other questions? <laughs> so this is just, I mean, you, you've talked about it, Adina, but I remember years ago when my son played basketball, they were like 13, 14 year olds, and one of the kids showed up, he had three or four cans of um, those energy drinks that his, mm -hmm. his dad gave him. You know, drink these before the game. And I was just remembering, I said, wow, that can't be good. Mm -mm. Um, and I'm assuming that, you know, you get this momentary burst of energy, but I'm assuming that kid was going to crash after that. Can you talk about that kind of practice? Because to the point where these kids get so much bad advice yeah. from the people closest to them. You know, caffeine is a well-studied ergogenic aid, but, um, you know, when we look at 
teenagers or younger athletes and um, we look at what else is in those energy drinks, again, not regulated and usually thousands of percentage of our vitamin, our B vitamins for the day. Um, and five seems absolutely insane. Like it's like a heart attack waiting to happen. Um, there, you know, again, we have to go back to basics. Why are we having this and why do we need all this extra? Um, are we sleeping well? Are we eating enough? Are we, are we choosing the right foods? Why do we need all this extra energy? And, um, for adult athletes, even looking at some of the pre-workouts and stuff like that, um, we could plan around caffeine. You could just get a black coffee. You don't need a super expensive pre-workout and that's fine as long as everything else is optimized. So for kids having energy drinks, I don't think it's, it's necessary and, and, um, sometimes more harmful than helpful because yeah, sometimes they could, could crash afterwards. And it's, it's really getting to the why, why are you taking this? Why do you need it? Yes, that was a great question because I do see a lot of uh, uh, drinks that are supposed to give you energy. And one person said, if you just look on the content on the back of these uh, energy things, you can tell that they're not going to give you the energy that you need to prolong the, the thing. They're going to give you a boost for a few seconds, then you're going to get a major crash because of the ingredients inside. Yeah. And, you know, food is is our energy. It's our fuel source. And we, you know, we need to look at that first. It's not that all, all these B vitamins are going to be super magical or this one ingredient is going to be super magical. Um, you know, if the foundations aren't there, we're, they're, they're not going to help that much. And it's excessive. It's just way too excessive. Okay. Any other questions anybody have? If not, I just want to let you know, I did put the website uh swag uh, website up there and we are supposed to have all of these uh videos that we're doing for human performance posted by the end of next week so going forward once that's carved out on the website things are going to jump on the website a lot faster if you all would like to view um the content again Okay, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I don't want to hold you. Uh, I know everybody has a busy afternoon. Thank you for giving us the time. That was a great presentation. Can you please let the folks know where they can contact you if they wanted to get your, uh, your presentation directly, if they wanted to reach out for more questions? Can you add, um, tell everybody how they can reach you? Yeah, I would say best email is probably um, Adina, A-D-E-N-A at nutritionbyadina.com. Um, I have an Instagram, but um, it's like a full-time job to manage. So haven't been on there in a while, but there's some sports stuff on there, some nutrition content. Um, and that's just my full name, Adina underscore Neglia, N-E-G-L-I-A um, on Instagram. So those are probably the two best ways. Okay, so I just put your email in the chat box. Is that correct? Uh, just uh, to help everybody out. Uh, yes, that looks good. Okay, so that is good. And then let me get your IG here as well so the folks can visit as well. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out. If not, you can always reach out directly to me, uh, anthony.smalls, S-M-A-L-L-S, at mssm.edu. Um, any questions, anything that you need, I would try to connect you with anybody. I try to be as a, as a, a be an assistance to any way that you need along your journey, especially uh, with swag. But um, with that being said, we look forward to seeing everybody next week. <laughs> Thank you again, and everyone have a wonderful day. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.